Hi everyone. Uh, this is a great pleasure to welcome here in this hall Bill Gutentag, Academy Award Documentary Filmmaker with his master class called Making the Real Dramatic and the Fictional Real. Please warm round of applause. Very flattered that uh, you took part of your afternoon to listen to uh, what I have to say. Um, please, as I speak, if you have questions, feel free to ask me questions. I'll also have a QA and a at the end, but ask me questions and I'm happy to answer. Yeah, if you want to interrupt, Bill says that he's happy if you do that. And so we start? Okay, yeah, let's start. Okay, so the class which I'm doing here um, is you know, making the real dramatic and the dramatic real. And I think that um, there are a lot of really mediocre documentaries out there that are not very dramatic. Um, they're boring, and they're often boring on interesting subjects. And a lot of times people think about going to documentaries with the same feelings they think about as going to the dentist, you know, and um, which is really sort of unfair because there's so many good films out there. So the goal is to make documentaries that are dramatic and to tell stories in a way which are true to the facts but also dramatic. Um, and I also make some fictional films, and the fictional films I do, I try to make feel very real. And I'll, I'll show some clips from that as well. You want the dialogue to feel real and the acting to feel very real, because when things feel real, you develop an emotional connection to the story. Um, so. I'm going to speak a little bit about film openings, what drives the story, characters, dramatic and memorable moments, and more. And uh, I'll show some clips to illustrate my points. Um, so to start out with, um, and again, please interrupt me anytime. And there won't be a lot of PowerPoint slides, but there's a few. So the first one is <coughs> this. This is sort of the motto of where I, I live in Silicon Valley sort of the center of the tech world, and this is the motto of the tech world. There's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. And it was sent by the singer-poet Leonard Cohen. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm just trying to tell stories as best I can. On this, And you're trying to create a world where stories are being told. This is from Grand Budapest Hotel. Um, and really, it comes down to this. All great literature is one of two stories. A man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. You know, that's basic. If you think about every film you've ever seen that's done well, they're, they're usually addressing one of these two stories. And, uh, you know, they're, they're told, a lot of people said this, but uh, tribute to Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and others. Um, and one thing I try to keep in mind as I work is that every character in a film should want something even if it's a glass of water, which is from the author, Kurt Vonnegut. So characters all need to have to want something. Um, and films are written three times. Can everyone, is there, everything is uh, understandable? Yeah. Okay. okay, okay, okay. Films are written three times. The first time you write a film is as a script. Um, it's a, a screenplay for a narrative film. For a documentary, it's written in a treatment. The second time, you write a film is you do it when you're filming. That's the second time you do it. And the third time you write a film is when you're in the editing room. So, um, and before making any film, many filmmakers, including me, um, will ask, you know, why make this film? What am I hoping to say? And why, you know, am I the right person to make this film? And it's a very highly competitive space out there. And everyone who makes a film, I think, should say, who is the audience for this film and why will they watch? Like, I'm not comfortable with people who say, I only make a film for myself. Because then I say, well, don't show it to me. Show it to yourself. You know? So I think that you have to have an audience in mind for your film. Um, and we exist in a very competitive space. We exist in a space where films are competing with games, and they're competing with social media, and they're competing with 
television. I mean, there's a lot of competition out there. And when you make a film, people are giving you, for a film, they're giving you two hours of their lives that they're never going to see again. For a TV series, they're giving you many more. For a video game, they're giving you a lot more than that. And you have to say, what are you giving the audience back for those two hours of their lives that they're never going to see again? So I think that there's a theory that for any film or TV series that the most important scenes are the opening scenes and the closing scenes. So I'm going to show an example from my film of an uh, of a, of a opening scene. And this is a film which I made um, called, the, uh, called Man King. And, um, and it's, it's about the rape of Nan King. Does anyone here know what the rape of Nan King is? So, like, just about nobody. So this is a really important story in Asia. It's not well known, particularly outside of Asia, but very briefly, the, um, in 1937, Japan invaded China, and in six weeks, they killed several hundred thousand people, two to three hundred thousand, and they raped tens of thousands of women and girls in six weeks, and it's left a scar on China that still has not healed. Um, and I was asked to make a film on this, and there's a book, and the book was called The Forgotten Holocaust. And I thought the words forgotten and holocaust should not be in the same sentence, but I didn't know how to make the film. And I walked around where I teach, and walked around and walked around, and I came up for an idea for the film, which you'll see in a few minutes. Um, but this is a really important event, but really, um, people don't really, audiences don't care about events, they care about people. So um, there's a misquote from Stalin, which has sort of guided my whole career. And the misquote from Stalin, which apparently he never said, but is, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. So that's what I try to do all the time, is to provide the tragedy and not the statistic. Um, so you try to pull an audience into your story. And I came up with a story which, look, I'm sure you're you know, extremely good educations and you don't know about the story. It doesn't mean that you're poorly educated. It just means people are forgetting about the story. But it was a really important story. So I came up with an idea, which, well, you can tell me if you think it was, it was successful or not. But uh, I'll, um, I'll, show the, I'll show the first, uh, this is the first six and a half minutes of the film. It's a film called Nan King, and the film originally premiered at the uh, Sundance Film Festival. Storytelling point of view, um, you know, you have to open strongly. I mean, I should also say on this film, um, I, I put actors in here. I'm, I'm guessing you recognize some of these people. This is Woody Harrelson and other, some well-known people as well. And it was also a way of selling the film. For example, I worked on this film for uh, a year and a half, and Woody Harrelson worked on the film for one day. But when it came time to get out there and promote the film, Woody Harrelson was out there doing interviews, which was great for the film. Um, and, you know, and what's interesting is, I don't think people, most people care particularly about this subject, but it had a way of sort of connecting with people, and, you know, the film played all over the world, and that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to have a film that, you know, can play in Mexico or in Stockholm or you know, wherever, and uh, you want it to reach all sorts of people. And, and for a while, we were the, uh, this film became the, uh, the um, highest grossing uh, theatrical documentary in Chinese history. Um, and uh, and uh, so you hope in some small way that you're continuing to keep the history alive. Um, and then, but from a story point of view, I just wanted to talk about openings are very important. There's research presented in this book, Blink. Has anyone heard of the book, Blink? No. Okay, you've heard of Blink. So, yeah. good. So, Blink is a book by Malcolm Gladwell, and basically what it says is, your first impression of something is really, really important, right? So, um, if you think about, he starts out the book, the Getty Museum 
in Los Angeles, bought a Greek sculpture, and they paid a fortune for it, and they were very proud of it. And they brought in um, the head of the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, one of the leading art people in the country. The person walks in, sees the sculpture, and says, that's a fake. And they say, no, no, it's not a fake. We paid all this money for it. We had it dated. Um, it's not a fake. But they were nervous. So they brought in a woman from Rome, and they showed her the, um, they showed her the sculpture. It's called the Getty Kuros, sculpture of a young boy. She walked into the room and said, it's a fake. You know, and, um, and it, in fact, it was a fake. But there's something about the first time you see something that leaves a huge impression on you. Um, so the idea is if you have a bad opening, it's hard to recover from a bad opening in a, in a film. Um, so people debate openings a lot, and changes are often made to openings. But you need to grab an opening to have a big splash with your audience. But if you think about it, it's the way we live our lives and not just an opening of a film. Um, so think about books. You know, books need to have good opening lines. You know, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It's from Tale of Two Cities by Dickens. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way from Anna Karenia. I mean, these are really memorable lines. If you think about a song, like how many songs open with, with, you know, with a strong line that makes you remember them? Um, if you think about architecture, you walk into a building, you know, and you can be impressed and you can love a place. You can be impressed with a place in a, you know, a, uh, you know, a theater or a mosque or a cathedral. Um, the opening of a, you go out on a date. It's the opening of a date. How does a date open? Or the start of a video game. It's a, it's a really important list that you have to open strongly. And the question is, you know, what makes for a strong opening? Um, and the, the, the key thing is characters that you like and care about, you want to know what happens to them. Also, dramatic questions are being raised. The fundamental part of drama is intention and obstacle. Somebody wants something, and what are the obstacles stopping them from getting that something? And we'll, I'll discuss this more later. But an opening also invites you into a world. You're invited on a journey. Um, you're intrigued with what happens in the future. So the key plot elements are presented as well. So we all seek stories. Young children want to be told stories. You know, our ancestors sat around campfires telling stories. Every civilization has a history of telling stories. And we want to be part of this. This answers something very deep inside us, this desire to have a story. Um, and so, another, so you have to expose what's coming. You set up dramatic questions. And you ask, what's going to happen ahead? What is the plot going to be? What are the questions that are going to be raised and answers? So remember, every character wants something, even if it's a glass of water. So we need to connect emotionally with characters. It's, you know, heart, you know, it's your heart more than your head. We have to feel their sorrow when they fail, to celebrate them when they succeed. So good openings make you care about characters, and you learn about the characters. You're also invited into a world. So it can be a comic book world like Wonder Woman or Thor, a realistic setting like Cold War or Roma, you know, a massive fantasy world like Game of Thrones. It's countless more, but you're invited into a world. And you're invited onto a journey. And you're intrigued with what happens on that journey. You want to know, you know, what happens in the story you're pulled into the story. So I think that when I make a film, I think asking myself, why do people start watching at minute one and they care what happens at minute two and they want to stay to minute five or minute 55 or 105? And why do you watch? And the reason you watch is that there's a series of questions 
that are driving the story, and you want to know what's going to happen. So I'm going to show another clip from this film, which is later on in the film, and it's uh, just another section and uh, gives you another indication of, of what's going on in the story. See, as I said, the, the fundamental part of making a film is intention and obstacle. It's like, so there has to be a clear intent and there has to be a clear obstacle. And this is what creates the problem. Somebody wants something and what is going to stop them from getting it? You know, this is the basis of the drama. So if you think about it, there's a, there's a broad definition of what's obstacle. Um, you know, for example, in Game of Thrones, if you watch that, the obstacle is everyone, like Daenerys, and every and wants to sit on the Iron Throne, and everyone's trying to stop her from doing it. But a lot of times, obstacles can be much subtler. So, for any story to succeed, you have to have questions, and the questions are, you know, what will happen on the end, and what's going to happen along the way. And the best way to achieve this is with a character or characters that you truly care about, and want to know what happens to them the good, the bad, pain, joy, what is it? But you want to care what happens to them. You want to celebrate with them when they succeed, and you want to feel empathy with them when they fail. So you try to get pulled into the world of film. So you're not thinking about your sore knee from yesterday's jogging or grocery shopping you have to do, but you're pulled into the story, and you're hooked by the story. Whether it's you know, Roma, or Quiet Place or Wonder Woman, you just want to be pulled into that world. And the way you pull somebody into that world is you need a sharp focus on what your character wants and what are the obstacles, you know, to get it. So, um, and then once you start this, your audience should stay engaged. So as a general rule, um, there is, in Act 1, you chase your hero up a tree. Act 2, you throw rocks at your hero, and act three, you bring your hero down from the tree. So that's sort of the basic arc of what drama is, what keeps an audience involved. So you're, the first act, you're setting up things which will lay questions which will later be answered, you know, and so how is this going to be done? There's the famous uh, line from Chekhov, which is, if in the first act you've hung a pistol on the wall, then in the following act the pistol should be fired, you know, otherwise, why put it there? So it's every, you know, everything that you see in a film has meaning, or it should have meaning. And it's a very compressed time frame. So if you think about a movie, and someone has a drink of wine, right? Then that person just likes wine. If they have two glasses of wine, then they have a drinking problem. And if they have three glasses of wine in a movie, they're drunk. You know, because it's a, you know, it's a drinking, it's a, it's, we bring our expectations to a movie and we read into things. It's almost like when you see a movie and you have a, a woman, young woman, and she's nauseous, well, she must be pregnant. You know, we're bringing in our, you know, our expectations into a movie. But, you know, what I think about a lot is characters and what is it your character wants? What's preventing them to get that? So you need an emotional connection with your characters. You know, a series of questions that are going to be asked and hopefully answered. What are your characters' hopes and dreams, and how do you connect with them? So think about something that has meant something to you in the audience here. Who's meant something to you in a film, right? It's usually not an issue. It's usually a character. Like, who is it that makes you cry, that makes you smile, that makes you laugh? It's a character. It's not a political subject or a topic. So, you know, so I, I'm always thinking when I'm making a film, how do I make characters that people care about, whether they like them or they dislike them? Um, so I'm going to show another clip from a, uh, from a fictional film, which I did, which is a fake documentary. And the... the the, his, the story of this film is, I was uh, what's called a television showrunner, I was in charge of a TV series for an American network, and I heard lots of conversations in the room, and I thought, well, maybe I could turn into a satire, and 
this the film is about an American t uh, TV executive who wants to put on a show about a live um, version of Russian Roulette on American TV. So that's the, the, the conceit of the film. And the scene you're going to see, she's meeting with advertisers who are skeptical. And if people don't advertise, she's not going to have a show. So this is a, just a short clip, four and a half minutes. And it's a, I think it'll illustrate that, I hope. I'm going to show fewer clips and have more questions, because I think it's a little painful to watch some of these clips. Um, but I think <laughs> you know, you're looking for an emotional connection to your characters. And for documentaries, I look for something that connects you to the heart of a story. Um, for example, uh, I'll show the cl I have a film that's playing here later on, which hopefully will play, not like this. But, um, and it was, you know, one of the things we focus on is the assassination of Martin Luther King. And when I did the interview with one of the people who were there, the people who were around Dr. King when he was killed, it's almost, it's all, they tell it in almost religious terms. There was a Last Supper, and one of the people, if you watch it, you'll see interviewed, talks about, when I was doing the interview with him, we had a problem with the lighting, and, and um, we stopped filming for a moment, and then he, he turned to me and he said, you know, I can still feel the texture of Martin King's tie that day. You know, and so I think... You're trying to get people to be in some sort of emotional space. And then when the camera or whatever tech issue got fixed, he tells that story. Where you're trying to get people to give you this emotional connection. And, you know, he's told the story before a lot. But he still remembers feeling Martin Luther King's tie the day that he was, he was killed. So we're in a world where we're being bombarded with powerful images. There's images all over the place. And you have to... The expression in English, which I don't know translates, is cut through the noise. There's a lot of noise out there. How do you come up with images? How do you come up with scenes that are memorable? You know, which I try to think about when I make film. And the way you do this is stakes have to be high. It, you know, it has to be meaningful. In the Nan King film you saw, it was literally about life and death. I mean, in that story, hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Tens of thousands of women and girls were raped, but there were a lot of people who were saved as well. So it was literally life and death. And I'm going to show another <coughs> clip here from the same film I did. And it's later in the film, and the woman, the TV executive, succeeds in getting the show on the air. And here's an example from the show. It's just a four-minute clip, pretty short. And again, this is from a fake documentary. They talk about stakes, pretty high stakes. Um, so, so I used to try to think about film as a series of memorable moments. And you, the idea is you're trying to give folks memorable moments. And uh, I'm, I'm actually going to uh, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up. I want to hear your questions. But I'm going to show two more clips, and I'll wrap up. But it's a series of memorable moments. And that... The next thing is actually it's a two-minute reel which I used to help sell a film which I did. So I did a film recently that about an Australian journalist who did nine tours, meaning year-long, in, um, in in during the Iraq War and became a go-between. He worked, you know, he went between Al Qaeda and the U.S. and the coalition forces, and Al Qaeda would give him videos. And he slowly started going crazy during the process. And, um, and it was originally, so we took his footage and, uh, and made a film about it. So he had been filming for nine years with a camera, um, which originally wasn't meant to be aired. It was, we just took this footage and made a film about it. But it was hard to get people to fund the film. Like, no one really wants to do a film about the Iraq War. You know, it's like, like I can't speak for this part of the world, but... You know, American audiences don't want to see films about the Iraq War. They don't care. You know, I mean, there are these really important issues. You know, people don't want to hear the word Iraq, Afghanistan, Gaza Strip. They don't want to hear it. You know, I mean, it's in the paper. They don't want to hear it. So the idea is, how do you make a film that people actually want to see? And, um, and part of it was focusing on this character who was a, 
you know, kind of a brilliant journalist, but by being there for like all these years, it really took a toll on him. And we made a two-minute reel, and this is how films are sold now. You make a two-minute reel, and with that two minutes, you hope people will want to buy it. So in this case, the film was largely funded by the Australian government, but it premiered on HBO um, in the U.S. and playing all over elsewhere. So this is a two-minute reel, and I show this reel as something you can do to help sell a film. So here it is. Look, if you think about it, you, you have to get money to do films. So if you're a novelist, you need a laptop and an espresso, right? If, you need a paint, if you're a painter, you need a canvas and some uh, watercolors. But if you're a filmmaker, you need money. And uh, this is how we got the money with this, this two-minute trailer. This helped us get the money for the film, which you know, went on to HBO and other places. So um, I'm going to just show one more clip and then wrap it up with a couple of slides. But I mentioned before that films are written three times. They're written in um, a script or an outline. Um, they're written when you film and they're written when you edit. So the next clip I'm going to show is a film um, called Soundtrack for Revolution, which is going to be playing another hour from here. But this is a story of the American Civil Rights Movement, you know, a nonviolent movement which, you know, changed the face of the United States. But the stories are being forgotten. It's becoming like World War I. It's a powerful story, but people don't know about it. It's just the march of history. Children in school don't know about it. They're not being taught it that much. And we were looking for a way of bringing it alive. And I, and I should say, you know, I don't make these films by myself. Like the Nan King film I saw, I think we have 150 people in the credits. With all these films, there's a lot of people that work on it. And the film is saying now is, how do you keep the story of the American Civil Rights Movement alive? And one way is, you have modern musicians tell the story of an old story. And so I'm going to show one clip from it, and uh, a little luck it'll play. And, um, and then I'll just say a few things and take questions. Okay? A film is really, um, it's really like a, uh, a film's really like a startup. You know, it's like, what is a startup company? It's an idea, some money, and some talented people. And that's what you're trying to do in a film. You want a good idea, you want some money that can help you make that idea, and you want some talented folks on the film. And, um, and that's, and directors and showrunners and TV, you try to create an atmosphere where everyone feels that they want to contribute their best work to a film. And everyone has a lot at stake. Hours are long, it's difficult, sometimes it's underpaid, but you have to create a world where everyone wants to contribute to making the best possible film. So I just have a few more slides, if you could give me the projector back. Um, so please keep this in mind, that you have to keep moving. A lot of films don't move. So this is not a new idea. A body at rest tends to stay at rest. A body in motion tends to stay in motion. You gotta keep driving the story forward. I constantly think about, is it boring? Is the story moving forward? How am I moving it forward? And also, we're in a world of shortened attention spans. So um, in 2000, our attention span was 12 seconds, average attention span. Our attention span today is eight seconds. A goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. So most, you know, we have a shorter attention span than a goldfish. So when you're making a film, you got to keep this in mind. You know, people, you may not like the idea that people have short attention spans, but they do. And, you know, the true scarce commodity in the future will be human attention. And that's from the CEO of Microsoft. And back to storytelling, you know, I was in Brazil not long ago and they said, oh, when you list the greatest football players of all time, Pele holds one to 10. The rest start at 11. And I think this is true when it comes to great creative content. A great story, powerfully told, holds positions one through 10. The rest start at 11. So try to hope this is of some help and I'm happy to answer any questions. How do you actually avoid the predictability? 
in the script. Because very uh, uh, frequently the movies or and the scripts are criticized for being predictable, like you know you you can guess what's going to happen next. How do you avoid that? Yeah, and with documentaries, oh, you always have talking heads. You know that. <laughs> That's a really good question. I sometimes am on an airplane and when not listening to the sound, and I know exactly what's going to happen <laughs> because it's so predictable. So, you know, the object is don't. You know, I mean, if, it, if you feel like you're doing predictable things, you try not to do it. You know, I don't think there's a, there's not a magic bullet. You just have to be aware that you're being too predictable, you know, and that you have to think about it all the time. You have to think about every shot, everything that somebody says. I mean, this, this is like as old as filmmaking. It's, you know, if you show a picture of you, and the next shot is an ice cream cone, it's, well, that's a happy scene. A picture of you and the next shot is someone with a knife, you have a different set of emotions. But I think you have to think about it every single shot of the movie. Thank you. Okay, the next one. Oh, okay, the, the, the lady, yeah, here, yeah, right here. Uh, hello, здравствуйте. Можно на русском? Oh, Can okay. I give yeah, you a... Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, okay. Let, sorry. Okay, no, 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 no,
you know, to an audience that doesn't have any interest in it, and I looked over the audience, and they're all crying. You know, the same way I was crying. You know, so, by the way, the film is, you know, if you come out, it's, it's available. It's, it's out there, plays all the time. A company called Snag Films, you can find it. And when you see the scene, I've seen this, I've seen this scene hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, and I still get teary when I see it. So the idea is you're just looking for a powerful story, and you hope the powerful story takes it. Also, look, you're trying to sell a movie. You're trying to get people to see a movie about, you know, a Holocaust in China in the 1930s, you know, in, you know, outside of Asia, no one heard about it. They have no real interest in it. How do you get them to watch it? You know, you get them to watch it, but, you know, you have a movie star in it. And that's, you know, this is, we're in a world where art and commerce intersect. And this may be the commerce, but I don't really think it hurt the art. But, you know, it, you would have to tell me if you think it hurts the art. How much do you, do you have to think about marketing before you start the film? Like, the marketing in a broad way, in a, in a broad sense. I think about it all the time. Okay. I mean, I want people to see the films. I mean, to me, it's a failure if, you know, three people see the film. I mean, I want, you know, millions of people to see the film. So, you know, and that's a... And by the way, that's just... That's my view. Like, you know, if you have something worth saying, you want to do it. I think that's writers do that, musicians do that. You know, you want your film to reach an audience, and you have to ask yourself, well, why are they going to watch it? And what can I do to make them watch it? Okay, another question, please. Yes, yes, please. I think this is going to be in, in Russian Ukraine. Okay. Здравствуйте. Спасибо вам огромное за эту встречу. А мой вопрос будет каким-то логическим продолжением предыдущего вопроса, видимо. Вы сказали о том, что первое впечатление очень важно. Но первое впечатление зависит не только от режиссера, но и от актеров, которых подобрал сам режиссер. Да? Мне вот очень интересно, каким образом лично вы подбираете актеров. А что для вас важно? Это личностное содержание. Это типаж, это узнаваемость. Какие ваши главные критерии, насколько для вас долгим является отбор и как серьезно вы к этому подходите? Вот действительно ли важно для вас это очень сильно, либо для вас важнее художественная составляющая? Спасибо, мы поняли вопрос. Спасибо. Спасибо. Well. I think you want, with acting, you want people who are believable. I mean, on the film you saw um, live, if you were on the set, we were just looking, do they feel real or not? Do the characters feel real? It's like an emotional connection. You know, I did a film recently where I had a small but good part for like a 20-year-old. And I must have seen, I don't know, 30 or 40 20-year-olds. And then someone walks in and bam, she's amazing. I mean, just like kills it, you know? And it's it's this emotional thing. It's the same woman, there's an HBO show called Silicon Valley, if anyone watches it, and she's the only woman on Silicon Valley. But she, you know, but she was just great. I mean, there's an emotional thing. And then there's also going to the business side of it, there's there's people who help you with movies, casting it. And Part of what I talked about before is you want to create a team where everybody is going to do their best work for you, right? And for the film. It's not really for you, for the film. And when I was casting that film, I had, I don't know, like seven or eight roles at the end, which were one-line roles, and I didn't, uh, I hadn't cast them. The casting directors will put, you know, four or five people and put it up on a website, and you look at them. So I would wake up in the morning and look at them. And I called the casting director who did the film, and she's very well known, does all Darren Aronofsky films and Oliver Stone films, does a lot of good independent films, and someone I really trust, she cast Nan King and Live. Um, and, uh, and I called her on my way in, I was driving to the uh, set, 
And I said, I think you made a mistake. You know, I didn't see one of these, these characters. It was one-line roles. I said, oh, Bill, we interviewed 25 people yesterday, and none of them were good enough to put on to tape. So that's for a one-line role. So, you know, you want people who are going to help you out. So, yeah, and I, I think, again, it's an, emotional, it's an emotional connection. There's a famous line, um, supposedly true, from Sir Laurence Olivier, where a young actor goes up to Sir Laurence Olivier and says, I really want to be an actor. And Sir Laurence Olivier says, great, don't get caught. So, you know, this idea that you know, you want it to feel real, so that's what I'm always looking for. Who is going to make it, who's going to make it feel real? You know, sometimes, um, it's not just like on the actors, like for example, this girl um, in live who put the gun to her head, like one day she showed up on the set wearing way too much makeup. The makeup person, it was like he didn't read the script. You know, she didn't look like, like an 18-year-old tour guide in Hollywood. And what I know about makeup will fit into, you know, a thimble. I mean, nothing, zero. But I knew she didn't look real, you know? And that's part of my job. My job is that I'm trying to make it feel real, you know? And so I sent her back, you know, even though I know nothing about makeup. I just knew it looked fake, you know? And so I think that, that that's what you try to do. You're trying to create this world where people want to be with you. You know, again, I can't stress enough, people give you two hours of their lives that they're never going to see again, and you want them to sort of be pulled into your world and want to be in that world. It doesn't always have to be, you know, a happy world. I mean, I just watched, I'm be curious, has anyone seen the HBO show uh, Chernobyl? Sure, it's huge here. It's huge. Yes. Did, you, did you like it? Yeah. Uh, well, well, you, you cannot say that you like it, I mean, you can, so you cannot say that you enjoy it, but I mean, this is very powerful. Right, and, and you think about that, it was a really dark subject, right, very depressing subject, but every scene, I mean, to your question earlier, every scene in Chernobyl, something happened that you did not expect, right? The scene starts this way, and it goes to there, right? So, that's a series which was very dark subject, no movie stars, and was extremely popular. Well, you're not fair to Stellan Skarsgård and Emma Watson, actually. So, they, well, they're kind of a film star. Well, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think they were okay. fantastic. Okay. I don't think. And Jared Harris. I mean, they were oh, they were great actors, okay. but they don't. The expression in Hollywood is they don't open a movie, okay. meaning that <coughs> their name does not get people to go yeah, to the movie. Forget about his famous. Okay. What? Yeah, yeah but that, but it was a great, but it was great, and it was and it pulled you in. And part of the thing about it was every scene to me. I mean, what do I know? I'm my first time to Ukraine. I know nothing about nuclear reactors. I don't know anything, but I knew that I was in the throes of that story because it felt very real to me. And I think that the director and everybody, the costume person and the production designer and whatever. Everybody, the actors, they made it feel so real that it was undeniable. And that's where I think the power comes from. When it feels real, it feels undeniable. Okay, we have the time for, for the last question, unfortunately. Okay, the, 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 there, is a, there is a guy in a, in a yellow t-shirt. Добрый день. Хотелось бы поинтересоваться у вас вот таким вопросиком. Назовите имя своего любимого режиссера, свой любимый фильм, чем он вас восхитил. Только самого себя и свои фильмы называть нельзя. Спасибо. Well, first of all, don't worry. I wasn't going to give my own, uh, okay. my own name. Um, well, there's a little bit of a story. And I think that um, in terms of the director, there's two theories about foreign directors doing people who come to other countries to make films. One theory is they show up at a country and they don't know the first thing about the culture and they make dreadful movies about it. The second theory is you come to a country and you see the country better than the people in the country see themselves. So my favorite director is Ang Lee who is a Taiwanese director who lives 
does mostly films in the United States. And I think he's the best director on the planet. And uh, he's, that's my favorite director. And my, uh, my favorite film is uh, Casablanca. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> it's a predictable choice. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Guten Tag, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much.